Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Lisa, and I'm here today with my uh, very esteemed guest, Ben Kat. Hey, Lisa, welcome to Scorpio Season. Um, how's it going, Ben Kat? My lab is coming together. I'm trying to transform my office into a sort of um, hacker maker space kind of thing. So mm, maybe if I like dress the part, I'll actually become the part and actually learn the skills that uh, involve here. And I'm also tweeting about it to sort of almost create um, some embarrassment pressure on myself. Like if I tweet that I'm buying a soldering iron and I never use it, that'll be embarrassing. Then you'll just be embarrassed is what I'm yeah. hearing you say. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I hope <sighs> you don't embarrass yourself that way, then that would be tragic. Um, like, uh, <laughs> So our I actually letter- don't mind. I've used embarrassment as social pressure on myself to get things done before. It's kind of a fun technique. Mm, okay, I so we're doing the letter Y this week, right? Indeed, yeah. This, what uh, Do you have a snack this week? <laughs> so not very creative. I went for the first thing, yogurt. I, was say, I think we have the same snack. This is the first week we've had the same snack. Um, Which is actually quite impressive, yeah. Because I also have yogurt. Is that mine? One's fancy. Hmm. Oh, yours is much fancier, yeah. Still, maybe there's actually a good sign that we've done. This is our 25th episode, and next week with Z will be our 26th and final episode of season one. So finally, at Y, we are converging on food, at least, if not on another topic, right? Oh, yeah. All right, let's see what we end up doing for Z. Z is going to be difficult, but okay. I haven't started thinking about it yet, to be honest. Okay. Um, great. So <laughs> our first topic for why is, um, I picked this, it's yuxtaposition, or I guess if you the way you want to, you should, it's Spanish. So yuxtaposition, um, I'm sure I said that terrible, but um, the reason I like this word, so basically it's juxtaposition, but it's in Spanish. And what I like about it so much is that um, maybe this is like sort of a, a nerdy, like, kind of obvious when you say it like I like how it's like very close to the word juxtaposition so in itself it feels a little bit like a juxtaposition because it's like right on top of the English um in Spanish so like you can like feel the English Spanish right juxtaposed on top of each other I think that's what juxtaposition means um it's one of those words I think I know what it means and then when I start thinking about it I get really uncertain um Yeah, things that are kind uh, of like placed next to each other in an adjacency and uh, relationship. It's sort of adjacency with a relationship becoming apparent, right? Exactly. It's almost like, I feel like a good, um, maybe other word for it would be foil. So it's like a similar like foiling, how you have two things close to each other so that like... Though uh, that seems like a special case, like um, a thing can be a foil to another thing and that is one of the ways in which they can be juxtaposed. Like one of my favorite sort of phrases mm. growing up, which I like to like try and use in my own writing was incongruous juxtaposition. So incongruous juxtaposition is not the same as like, you know, foiling juxtaposition or harmonious juxtaposition, right? So incongruous mm. is like um, sort of um, in a musical sense, uh, cacophony or something like that. Like if I were to say a spoon, a spoon with a cup of yogurt is sort of a harmonious juxtaposition. You use a spoon to eat um, yogurt, right? But if I were to juxtapose, say, uh, this bottle of lens cleaner with um, yogurt, this juxtaposition is incongruous. And a foil would be, I don't know, what would a good example of a juxtaposition as a foil be? For some reason, I'm thinking of the example David Graeber used in his book, um, The Utopia of Rules. Mm-hmm. Um, which is where he compares uh, Sherlock Holmes and James Bond. Have we talked about this before? I get the feeling that no, we should we might have. No, we haven't. Oh, um, oh. So he does his like his point of using them as an example is like sometimes one way of investigating a subject is to find two things that are similar and seem like they're related and figure out what the differences are, and that's like one way of like kind of digging into. Um, maybe an aspect of police work, for example, is like taking um, James Bond and Sherlock Holmes and figuring out what's the same and what's different about them. So that's a, that's a form of like kind of foiling, but a juxtaposition as a foil, I think. Oh yeah, 
that's more like a differential diagnosis in medicine, like things that have like similar presentation and symptoms, and then you run a test to like tell them apart. When I think FOIL, I think actually, since we're on Sherlock Holmes as a topic, so mm. Watson would be a FOIL to Sherlock Holmes. Like Sherlock Holmes would be sort of the reasoning genius and Watson is kind of like the dumb, but sort of trusting friend who kind of follows along, right? So they play off each other. So I think, I, I think that's, uh, that's more of a foil relationship. Whereas uh, uh, James Bond versus um, Sherlock Holmes wouldn't be foils for each other. They'd be more like a differential. But they do hold up. There is some amount of mirroring that you can see. It's like where the mirror doesn't quite line up that you see an outline of the other. Yeah, but uh, but a foil is not a mirroring relationship. A foil is kind of like a uh, a psychological complementarity. Like if you're an introvert and I'm an extrovert, that's me being a foil to you in certain situations, right? Or good yeah. cop, bad cop, that's a foil relationship. So I guess there's there's an element of that in James Bond versus Sherlock Holmes. James Bond is sort of this uh, gadget freak out in the field running around sort of, uh, I don't know, action-oriented type have, hero, yeah, whereas he Sherlock really Holmes is an arm Yeah, like James Bond, as far as I can tell, I haven't seen a lot of the literature, so I might be wrong about this, but he's not much of a sleuth. He's yeah, he's like not a, a detective at all. He doesn't think. So yeah, they'd, they'd form a good, yeah, I guess you're right. They'd form a good team, but Sherlock Holmes would kind of like figure out the hypothesis and the clever clue and then send James Bond uh, off to like beat up the bad guy and like recover the, you know, secret treasure. So yeah, okay. they'd, they'd work well together. Actually, you know what a good example of that kind of relationship is? Did you yeah. ever read um, the books of uh, Perry Mason? Not the TV show, either new or old. So yeah. uh, the books are actually really good. Like I, I think it's better than either the new or the old TV show. And Perry Mason is a lawyer and he's basically kind of an investigative lawyer. And his foil mm -hmm. is a guy named Paul Drake, who's kind of like a, you know, gritty 1930s style uh, Dick Tracy type bad streets uh, uh, detective. So they are good foils for each other. And you could say that Perry Mason's, uh, uh, Perry Mason is like Sherlock Holmes while Paul Drake is like James Bond. So there's a, there's a little bit of that going on. Okay, so you've convinced me. Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, James Bond would be a good foil juxtaposition. Did I pronounce that right? It sounds much better than I think I did, yeah. yeah. Um, it's at the initial time. Yeah. What are, so, so what was the phrase you were saying that you liked using? Is that un something juxtaposition? Incongruous. So incongruous in as in opposed to congruous. So if you remember from high school geometry, congruent, mm -hmm. um, congruence is like what you say about like two triangles that are exactly alike, right? So congruent triangles. So incongruous, oh, right. okay. so things that not only are not alike, but shouldn't even be compared. So apples and oranges are mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. actually even that's kind of congruous. They're at least both fruit, but incongruous. Both round. Yeah, so there's, there's reasons to compare apples and oranges. But mm. anything that you juxtapose and it almost gives you like a grating sense of these things shouldn't be put next to each other, that's incongruous. So Can you uh, give an example? Well, your example was like a spoon and some lotion you had. Yeah, that's something. a bad example. But uh, I okay. came across, it, it was actually a popular phrase in a lot of the fiction I read. So uh, mm -hmm. it would be something like, you know, uh, Princess Diana rapping that would be incongruous juxtaposition, right? Because she represents a particular kind of like high gravitas British royalty culture and rapping is a black musical culture from the US. So that would be incongruous juxtaposition. Mm, I feel so like I, one of, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I see like almost, I want to say non sequitur, almost like the, but the situational non sequitur. Um, yeah, there's an element of that, exactly. Um, I think it's, yeah, it was kind of interesting. I think you're talking about juxtaposition. If we like pull out a little bit, it's, um, it seems like what we're really describing is a tool for analysis, right? Like all of the, all of the, um, situations that we've described are like, but they're situational analysis, right? You like put things next to each other and then the, the location of them being in the same place provides an opportunity to make observations about, what that scene produces. Um, in one case, you know, we yep. were talking earlier about the police detectives. And so it's like, okay, what is that? 
tell us about these characters that we couldn't see without them in the same room. And then you're saying Princess Diana and rapping. Okay, we put those in the same room and like all of a sudden you can see different things maybe than you would have otherwise. Or by composing these scenes, you you can do analysis and that's like a good mm-hmm. tool for analysis. It's like scene composition. Being yeah, and composition. you'd see like weird yeah. things that you might not otherwise. Like, you know, uh, yeah. A princess and a rapper, the one thing they share in common is bling, right? So mm-hmm. there'd be like diamonds and jewelry and there would be like elements of the visual presentation that are like similar, but sort of, I don't know, de- deployed in completely different aesthetics and with um, significations. Um, but, but this idea of like putting things next to it, each other as a form of analysis, I think that's fundamentally the reason we like the jigsaw puzzle metaphor. Like when you solve a jigsaw puzzle, the way you do it is like, you pick up two pieces and see, do they actually go together? And if they do, you put them together mm-hmm. and like, you know, build up the picture a little bit. So right. jigsaw puzzle is, jigsaw puzzles are juxtapositional problem solving uh, Oh, I see, because you can put each piece right? next to the other. Yeah. And uh, yeah, usually like people are really good at it. They get it sort of unerringly right. And they like, inst- if they put it together, it will fit. Whereas uh, <clears throat> inexperienced people, if they put it together, may or may not fit, it'll be a mistake. You, what you thought was blue sky is actually blue water and it doesn't belong where you think it does, that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, so that's, uh, oh, and uh, connecting that up to detective fiction, I think all classic <laughs> detectives um, kind of like use the jigsaw puzzle metaphor, like Hercule Poirot you, uh, says that a lot, like he's arranging his facts in order, you know, so there's a whole jigsaw puzzle feel there. Yeah, it's interesting. I just started reading this book called How to Solve It um, by a famous mathematician. His, his name's like Polya. Yeah. Is that the Polya? Yeah. 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 And it's really, the copy I have is um, pretty cool. It's got a foreword by John Conway, who he recently, he passed away this year, I think. Yep. Um, the Game of Life guy, right? We talked about him and we talked about hypergraphs, I think. And oh, yeah, H. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's got, he does a really nice, kind of beautiful um it's just sort of like introduction to the book because he says it's a book that taught him a lot um yeah um but it's interesting because it's so anyways I'm thinking a little bit about problem solving strategies because that is like that is what the whole book is about um but actually an interesting thing and I think maybe I think it was the Conway um introduction that pointed this out is that the way that the book is written it um it talks about a dialogue between a teacher and a student I think that's most of it. I really haven't gotten past through like the first chapter yet. So I'm very like first 20 pages of this book so far. But um, the r- interesting, so like one interesting thing that Conway points out about the way that Polia wrote the book is that the um, the dialogue structure and he, he critiques both what the teacher says and how the student like approaches it. So it's not just about you as a student learning how to, um, become better at problem solving by reading the book, but it's also a good instructive manual for someone who wants to teach others about how to solve problems, which is really interesting. So you can, as a teacher, read this book and learn ticks and tri- tricks and tips for um, getting better at pointing out how to solve problems to others, which is interesting. It's like the teach a man how to fish on steroids version of like problem solving because you're also teaching the teachers, not just huh. the student. Yeah, a couple of my aunts are actually, they're retired now, but they were math teachers. So I have a bunch of like um, aunts who were math teachers in my family. And Mm. they once told me that um, school teachers um, kind of formed their own little community of like um, copying tricks from each other on the best way to sort of explain a particular math concept or trick. And it's like a whole social network of uh, teaching these tricks. And now I think it a lot of it happened. I, I, I talked to a video startup once, which was all about getting teachers to record like, you know, the best five minute explanation of say the Pythagoras theorem or something like that. So yeah, uh, but math is I think actually a very good example of like juxtapositional problem solving uh, t- uh, techniques. And like, as you were talking about Paul, yeah, I was trying to think, is there a math example? And I came up with one like, you know, the formula for summing up n numbers, right? One plus two plus three all the way to n. It's n into n plus one by two, right? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so the sum of all numbers up to 10 is 10 into 11 by two, so 55. 
So the way to see the proof of that is you write down the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then under it in a second row, you write down the same sequence in reverse. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, mm -hmm. 3, 2, 1, right? And then you can see that by symmetry, each of the columns adds up to 11. So that's a juxtaposition of the thing with, its, with itself in reverse order, right? And that's a trick for both discovering a formula and uh, sort of yeah. proving but math is a lot like that, right? It's just a matter of figuring out what the correct ju juxtaposition is. So like in this, mm -hmm. this case, it's taking the two number lines, lining them up, and then flipping one of them, reversing one yep. of them. But until you can draw that scene, so to speak, you don't really see what the trick is. Or it's like not necessarily intuitive until you get what the picture is. I think this is something that like my math education, for whatever reason, maybe it was the teachers, maybe it was me just not being very bright i mean whatever i did fine in math class um but maybe that was the problem i was doing fine even though i wasn't really understanding it i don't know anyways um one thing i didn't really understand until like recently is how visual math is like so much of math is actually like pictures there's pictures behind most of it like this picture we just described with two member lines and one of them's reversed and that's how you like do it but it's like very very like pictorial juxtapositional pictorial like you there's always some model or larger reality that the math is describing and like what you see on the paper is a like thin veneer that is hiding this like larger picture sort of like it's a, it's a abstraction of a, a larger thing um and figuring out that there's like a bigger thing actually going on was actually really helpful for being able to figure out how math works sometimes that's very general but so uh, I've thought a lot about this aspect of math because um, I, I think like you, I'm good enough at math and I did well in school, but I don't think I'm particularly super talented at it. But yeah. uh, I often thought about uh, like, you know, people think that math is not actually super visualizable beyond a core. Like, you know, geometry, for example, you can visualize up to three dimensions, but once you hit four, five, six, or like large dimensional vector spaces, you kind of have to deal with just symbols. But then if you think about it, the symbols themselves form a visual space, which you often manipulate in extremely visual ways. Like what we just uh, talked about, the formula for sum of numbers, that's an actual jigsaw puzzle-like trick. You've literally yeah. created a visual line, another visual line, you flipped one of the jigsaw puzzle pieces and you've put them together, together and you could you could even make this like an actually visual thing because an increasing sequence of numbers is basically a triangle. If you draw, drew that as a graph, one to 10, it would be like a slope of uh, 45 degrees, right? So you'd get a triangular wedge. So you're putting two triangular wedges together, kind of like this, and it's forming mm -hmm. a rectangle. And n into n plus one by two is basically the same as the uh, area of a triangle, right? Except in discrete space. So you're actually literally solving uh, continuous geometric, geometric area problem in sort of uh, number sequence. And you see this all the time with uh, uh, algebra cool. as well, like continued sequences when you're like doing the summation of like things like, you know, X plus X squared plus X cubed, kind of like infinite sequences in series. You have the same kind of effect. Like even though you're doing things that are like infinite dimensional and in theory, you shouldn't be able to visualize them at all. You've transposed them into sort of a symbol space where you are again doing like visual sort of manipulations. And I think this is why mathematicians are extremely sensitive to their sort of sensory tactile media, which you wouldn't think, right? Because it, it's mm -hmm. sort of so in their heads, but they're like all, they're the only people I think who still love using chalkboards and chalk. Like everybody else, I kind of don't care whether I'm using pen and paper or whiteboards or chalkboards, but mathematicians really want to use chalk because I think they've trained their sort of, I don't know, spatial pattern and juxtaposition instincts with chalk and board maybe. Hmm. So ah, there, that yeah. is interesting. We need that chalkboard juxtaposition on top of their symbolic language to like <laughs> make sense for them. It's cool. Yeah. Cool. And, and I, I've heard this about, you know, chess and Go players as well. Like one of my friends is a Go player and he was playing on an uh, iPhone app for a long time, but he mm -hmm. ordered this like very classic Japanese Go set. And he spent like um, half a day just sort of retraining a sort of visual tactile sense to, you know, have its intuitions grounded on the physical board instead of the mm -hmm. app. So th there's a lot of that. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Speaking of math stuff, we should, maybe we should move on to our next topic, um, which is why combinators. Um, mm -hmm. We have 
<laughs> we have we I put both of the Y Combinator, the institution, and then also its namesake, I would assume, Y Combinator, the um, math function. Um, which do you which should we talk about first? Uh, do you understand the math function? Like I just looked it up on Wikipedia and I kind of get it, but not really. But can, oh, you, it's, can you explain it? What is a Y Combinator function? I'd, I'd have to look it up. It's been a long time since <laughs> I've understood them, um, to be honest. I, uh, I know that it's a function. It's like the basis of lambda calculus would be my understanding. I think yeah. I can contextualize it. I don't think I can explain it. I did at one point know how to like use them, but this was like eight years ago in hacker school. I spent like a week figuring out how to like do the Y combination, like alligator stuff. Um, there's actually like, so weird facts I know about Y combinators um, or lambda calculus is that um, there's a subset of, um, so when people are trying to explain how to do lambda or Y combinator calculations, because it's a, um, I think it's a generative, you kind of have like iterations of, it's almost like, it's almost like the game. It's a recursion, right? You it's a recursion like, towards a set point or something like that. I don't know if it's exactly recursion, but it is like a, there are like um, rounds, so to speak, like every application of the function is a round. So it's like very, um, so I, I think you're applying the same function, but the inputs change, but the inputs are the output of the previous. So I guess that is a recursive function. Um, and then how the rounds progress and what outputs you get depends on, I guess, initial starting conditions. The, um, but there's something really cool and interesting and generative about them that I don't really exactly remember. Um, something about like, you end up with the same, anyways, there's cool stuff about them. That's the, that's the fixed point stuff. Like I got that much from reading Wikipedia like 20 min minutes ago. So it's a fixed point as in, you know, um, it, it, like when you keep applying the function, the output doesn't change. So you can keep applying it. So it's like, you know, the, uh, I was making an analogy to the continuous math version where uh, uh, if you, the solution of an equation is, a fix, is the fixed point of that equation. So I think that might be what you're referring to. Okay, so. Um. Might be. But okay, well, the interesting thing about them is that um, over the years, there have been several, you know, when you try and attempt, so, you know, going back to math teacher thing, people come up with tricks of how they explain things and why combinators, I think, are complicated enough that, you know, you need a good analogy to describe them to students. Um, and over the years, several different analogies have been developed, all of which use animals of some sort. I think the most famous is the one that's like an alligator thing. And so like the alligators produce eggs and then the eggs hatch and depending on the color of the eggs and which the alligators get produced, they either get consumed by the next iteration of the function or um, reproduce different colored eggs. And so there's like a rule set about which kind of like how the iterations of the functions go based on outputs okay. kind of thing. Um, there's, I think, a bird example. Like, so in the back of some Lambda Calculus text, is it Lambda Calculus? Church and yeah, stuff? Yeah, it is Lambda Calculus. Um, like church, I get, anyways, um, I think there's like a bird example. So there's like alligators, there's birds, um, like there's little stick diagrams you, you draw for the Lambda Calculus, I think is why that you use alligators anyways. Um, yeah, but it's like function application. So it's like this cool generative, I say generative because it kind of has this like, um, every round produces more rounds. Like you don't ever run out yeah. of rounds for some reason. I don't know, this must be the fixed point thing you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at- um, but It almost feels like magic. It almost feels like magic. Yeah, each, uh, so yeah, the analogy I was making to continuous math is, uh, uh, like, uh, what's a good example? So, the, uh, uh, have you seen the logistic equation? It's x equal to a times x squared plus b. So, it, it's the classic model of predators and uh, prey that um, kind of kicked off uh, chaos theory. So, this equation, it's a very simple e uh, recursion. So, x equal to x squared plus uh, some constant. You keep but applying it, you get that um, bifurcation diagram that uh, is, you know, the classic image of chaos theory. And uh, that's, that's kind of generative. Like it's, uh, it's kind of got this explosion of interesting dynamics. Uh, I, I guess that might be why it became the inspiration for Y Combinator, the institution, sort of a, a generative function, startups creating more startups, something like that. I would guess so, yeah. 
so funny thing about that, when I first heard the term Y Combinator, I hadn't um, heard about the computer science term. So I thought it had something to do with the Y chromosome. And I vaguely remembered something from biology, like the Y chromosome is the chromosome that mutates the fastest or something like that, because I, I don't oh, know I what, believe this. Yeah. And that sounded to me like a very sort of gendered masculine way of labeling a startup incubator as a fast innovator or something. But then somebody corrected me that no, it's a reference to the Lambda calculus. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, it's the sort of thing that nerds would come up with it without really thinking about the gendered implications, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, I could see why you would think that. I, I didn't know what a Y Combinator was. But yeah, so let's talk about YC, the institution. Oh, I wanted to, so this interesting thing about the Y, I wanted to just jump off your Y chromosome comment. Mm -hmm. We should put Y chromosome on this list. That's a great All one. All right, let's um, the, uh, So I have a, a friend who knows a lot more about biology than I do. Um, and she's got this really interesting theory about how, so Y chromosomes, well, hmm, I might be wrong about this. I'm going to get this wrong. Should I, should I go into it anyway? Um, this show is all about I, both of us getting things wrong. What? Because the Y. So do the Y chromosomes change even while you exist? I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I've heard something of the sort. They're very unstable. Yeah. Okay. That's what. So that's what she was. So like, basically, men like your Y chromosomes are like updating kind of all the time, sort of like as you exist. So um, they're more reflective of now of the, our current environment. So they've adapted to the day to day so to speak. Um, so like last week, yeah. last month, maybe the last five years, your Y chromosomes in theory have been updating or updated at some, in some way, or they, they carry more up-to-date information than the X yep. chromosome, which is what the women have in your like eggs, right? So when you procreate, you get from the woman, you get the more stable XX that hasn't. So like the, the regeneration of X chromosomes would be every like 20 years, let's say. Um, whereas the mutation, so the mutation cycle that an X chromosome would go through would be on a much longer time scale than a Y chromosome. So when you create a new human, um, they get this like kind of, you know, let's say the conservative traditional values from the X chromosome that haven't been updated in 20 years or whatever. Um, and then you get like your Y chromosome from the men, at least the men are the carriers of like the more up-to-date of like, what's actually going on in society now so to speak so in this way like men of the species would be the more like up, i don't know again this is me like so sort of this is this up. is so how i, I think like... um, the 19th century early social darwinists kind of slid into eugenics because if you kind of make these weird metaphoric leaps from like yes. generation to generation procreation like think about like for example if if it's true that the y chromosome is the locus of like immediate changes then it would be the likely site for epigenetic transfer, right? So uh, tr like the examples of like uh, mm. Jewish people having like a particular sort of uh, trauma passed on generation to generation. But the fact is that within a generation, it would be passed on to both the male and uh, uh, female siblings through like crossover and other crap, right? Uh, mm. But wait, hmm. actually no, the Y chromosome yeah. wouldn't cross over. So that's no. the one that doesn't cross over. So yeah, yeah. maybe it, it will stay stable, okay. I'm arguing against myself now. So, uh, but I'm actually trying to think. Did you ever get 23andMe sort of testing done? No, I haven't. Oh, so uh, I did, and I vaguely remember one thing. So the, yeah. there's the mitochondrial DNA which you get from your mother's um, lineage, and um, Y chromosome Wait, stuff. Hang on is... one sec, Venkat. Let me go see what this dog is barking at. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. So Sorry. I got the 23andMe results and um, so it gave me two pieces of data. So it said that my uh, paternal haplogroup is something called R1A1A and the maternal group is something called, uh, uh, that's the mitochondrial DNA one which you get from your mother's side. That was called M3A or something. And the interesting thing is the 23andMe report said something like the M3A uh, lineage devi deviated from its parent like a hundred thousand years ago or something and the r1a1a one one uh, deviated like twenty thousand years ago so the male lineage is um, sort of branches from the evolutionary trunk or whatever the tree more recently than the female so you could be right that maybe the uh, x chromosome is overall more stable but uh, but i think there's something off about naively extrapolating sort of the rates of evolution of the x and y to 
temperaments and adaptability and I don't oh. know yeah. personality traits of men and women, but maybe there's something there. I don't know. No, I, I wasn't saying that, but I think it's cool if you kind of zoom out a little bit that like woman has like the con or like the bearers of the more conservative like genes so they're like longevity right whereas like the male genes to some extent would be adaptability right so it's like you need both to keep a species alive yeah do i think uh, okay. i don't know it's a nice much of it is actually explained by the fact that women are the childbearing gender so just having young children and being the primary caretaker and protector would make you a lot more conservative than men and in oh. a lot of species in the wild, if the babies get eaten, like alligators, I believe, it's the males that um, eat their own babies or something. And uh, like mm. in other species like lions, if a new lion comes and takes over a pride, it'll kill all the cubs um, from the that previous sire. So, yeah. yeah. I guess when I was saying conservative, it wasn't necessarily a political sense, but just in like the true biological oh, yeah, sense yeah, yeah. that it yeah, has. Uh, like... That's what I understood yeah. you to mean. Okay. Okay. Well, but so we got down a random bunny trail of um, genetics. My chromosomes. Yeah. Yes. It's why? So it's on top. Well, it's on, on stuff. Um, but we should get back to the institution, Y Combinator. Yes, yes. Um, y Combinator. When did you first hear about Y Combinator? So you thought it was Y chromosome, but it's actually it's Y Combinator. Um, computer science, yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually don't know. Probably... When did I first hear of it? How old is it? Isn't it from like 2006 or seven or something like that? Like, it's fairly old, right? Yeah, but I, yeah. I must have heard of it maybe 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and I think like many people, I first heard of it through Paul Graham's essays. Like um, Paul Graham's essays were the sort of primary sort of marketing uh, channel. When for... did Hacker News pop up? That was also fairly early. Like Paul Graham wrote the uh, his weird version of Lisp, uh, speaking of Y Combinators, and he wrote the software for Hacker News in that version of Lisp, right? I think it's called R yeah. or something. I have no idea. Okay. Um, yeah, when did you hear about it? When I applied to go to hacker school, which is now called Recurse Center, um, because it is a YC company, um, hacker school. It is? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know YC had, mo oh, okay. It's a YC funded company. Okay. Well, it was a YC. They went and did a Y Combinator batch and decided to come up with a recruiting. They were going to do software recruiting. So they weren't building a school when hacker school started um they were building a recruitment agency and then realized that if they put a school in front of it it would uh then they would it's like vetting it's like vetting new candidates for whatever is a hard problem so if you have like kind of like a school attached to it then you have like time to figure out who would be a good fit for what jobs so it becomes your feeder huh. for your um whatever so, thing so um, speaking of your, that particular model and uh, lambda calculus since we were just talking about it Lambda school is that model, right? Lambda school is basically uh, kind of uh, yeah. sell your future share, future income share agreement, and then you get education in return. And it's basically a recruitment startup, not an education startup. Yeah. The hacker school is the same thing. The difference is that hacker school never tried to scale. Well, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of differences. Okay. Well, there's two. One is that hacker school at some point realized that it, scaling wasn't sustainable or that they weren't sure they could scale the experiment that they had started in New York city anywhere else. Um, so they never attempted to grow beyond like their one batch or two batches. They did a few small things, but it's basically the same. It's been the same thing for a long time, like 60 people at a time, roughly. Um, roughly and um you know that's just they just constantly have people in the space um the other thing is that whereas my understanding is lambda school like you know and and hacker school has no there's no teachers there's no curriculum you just show up and work on whatever you want so it's a little less and whereas lambda calculus they actually recruit professors they seem like there's like units you go through and there's like curriculum yeah. and grades and things get checked off um they also do lambda lambda calculus lambda school lambda school Lambda school also, um, it's kind of funny that Lambda and Recurse Center are like very similar. Anyways. They might both Recursive. be inspired by Y Combinator's naming strategy. So it's kind of like sub-brands. Recursion Maybe. and... Interesting. Uh, I know Lambda. the Recurse Center got renamed Recurse Center because they could get the domain recurse.com. Um, that was the reason. And it's a reference to recursion? Yeah. So there is yeah, a strong relationship is between to... recursion and Y Combinators, I think so. So there's probably a familial branding relationship. Yeah, 
Right. Anyways, the other difference is that, um, and if you go through a recruit center, you don't end up, you don't pay anything. And then if you get recruited, you also don't, there's no income share. The company that recruits you pays them a finder's fee, like a referral fee. Ah, okay. So they make their money off referral fees, not of income share agreements. So there's no, like once you graduate and get a job, there's no anything. Huh. And uh, you as a person. So did you get a job right out of um, Recurse Center and did they give the Recurse Center uh, finder's fee? Okay. Yeah. Somebody actually... discovered you and got paid for it at some point. What? Somebody discovered you and got paid for it at some point. <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I went to Etsy, so. Okay. So Etsy paid them. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 but that's how I heard about Y Combinator is because the hacker school that I was going to was birthed there, so to speak. Um, so, yeah. Okay. But like a and, lot of big companies came out of Y Combinator, came yeah. out of Airbnb is like the more famous one. Did Lyft come out of Y Combinator? I don't um, think so. Not a big Not stuff sure. Uh, but, but those uh, Dropbox, Dropbox is the other big one that yeah. came out of uh, Y Combinator, I think. I think between oh, I those that. two, like 70% of the returns that YC has enjoyed is from those two companies, which is uh, mm-hmm. classic profiles for any sort of VC type um, investment for yeah. like a couple of companies will return the fund. Yeah, I mean, it's also funny when you think about the number of people <sighs> that I at least knew in Silicon Valley that were, or in SF that were employed by either of those companies. Well, I didn't know that many people who worked at Airbnb, but like the number of people that get employed there is like large too. Like, so it's not just VC money that, goes into them or they get returns but also like the number of software engineers that are making their money then off of those companies is like quite yep. big so like the the gross impact on like the total ecosystem of software development is quite large um i think to a certain extent like you know like new york city isn't super famous for having any big successful super startups i would say etsy is probably probably the biggest one unless i'm forgetting something like Dodgeball was big. Dodgeball was a thing, but they got bought or they're not really such a big thing. Uh, Kickstarter was the other big one, but they went through big layoffs recently. And like, um, Meetup was New York based. But but the thing about all East Coast startup hubs is if they get big enough, they move to Silicon Valley. So it's kind of like an unfair comparison, right? Like Facebook grew up in Boston and then moved to San Francisco. I mean, the Bay Area and Facebook is now. Yeah, but Boston isn't New York City. But it's also another second tier startup hub, right? Like after Bay Area. Is it? Yeah. Like for the more sciencey uh, oh, yeah. uh, startups, yeah. biotech, uh, more the more advanced stuff. MIT is yeah. there, so. But it's not pure, but that's not pure software the same way that like the software companies out of New York. Yeah, many of them are things like robotics companies or hardware companies and stuff. But okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, so you're the alum of like a YC funded company. Okay, so you have a closer yeah. relationship than, uh, well, I have no relationship with them. <laughs> two iterations, maybe like, you know, an iteration or two removed, but yeah, it's kind of weird to think about. Actually, oh, hmm. it's, it's kind of funny. Y Combinator, the outfit inspired so many clones and uh, there's, there's tech stars, which is kind of the alternative strategy to Y Combinator. Like Y Combinator, I think, tries to, there was a lot of writing about this at one point, like um, Y Combinator, uh, it was called Black Swan Farming. So look for the extreme outlier wins and things like Techstars kind of try to do a more uh, sort of uh, mediocre middle of the road. I shouldn't call them mediocre, but like, you know, more average yes, startups. Like instead of like 50X returns on like one or two startups, look more for like, you know, five to 10X on a lot of startups in the middle of the curve. So it's a slightly different strategy. Oh, money. I think they called it money ball for startups or something. I think Dave McClure wrote this. I see. Is yeah, Techstars the ones that does one. Techstars Disrupt? Like the Disrupt conferences, like they're associated with Techstars? Am I thinking of the right thing? I think so. Um, it's kind of weird. I used to be a lot more plugged into the tech scene like five, six years ago. I've slowly become, I'm still sort of very plugged into the technology world through my consulting work, but the tech scene as in, you know, the startups plus VC ecosystem, I've become, apart from like a few close uh, friends who are in it, I don't keep up anymore. There's something kind of like, it's gone stale for me. Do you feel that? Like you moved to Texas, so you must have felt that a little bit. 
maybe i don't know yeah i don't actually know where all that like so i mean i feel like there's been some critiques of white combinator within the last few years about it most oh, like i guess i've seen them on twitter most of the critiques of the yc companies tend to be that they're most of them are doing software as a service plays um so like the kinds of the kinds of companies that yc is like promoting or tend to do well coming out of Y Combinator or ones that were software as a service. And that's because you can use the other batch mates as like your, um, yeah. your initial users. And like, it's, it's a little like, uh, it seemed like it was getting a little closed in. Yeah. Like very inbred. There's definitely an inbreeding aspect going on there, which is both a strength and a weakness. I think like at one point, this sort of, uh, the premium effect, you could call it, like simply getting accepted into Y Combinator was kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because it would create all the conditions for its own success. Like being accepted meant you'd get like uh, guaranteed funding when you exited from like a bunch of people who'd committed it. Like, you know, Yuri Milner at one point had this spray and pray kind of um, investment model, right? Very simply like matched YC's grants with like 100K per startup or something plus the cohort effect you're talking about. But yeah, that's, that's definitely caused a sort of inbreeding. And I think that's shown up in their sort of the difficulties they've had branching out into other areas of startups, like, you know, hardware or uh, renewable energy or whatever the hell they were trying to do or the scholarship program they were trying. And I think uh, uh, they were almost a victim of their own success. So I, I don't like to criticize them because they kind of pioneered this whole way of doing things. Like now you could say that, you know, uh, angel list kind of like um, disrupted them by going underneath <laughs> it, right? It like interrupts. The Aren't they a the YC policy. company? Are they a YC company? Aren't they? No, they're yeah. from no the novel. Like I think is from. Like, thing. No, the founder novel was the you know, founder of Epinions. So Epinions was a Web 1.0 era company. So contemporary with people like Paul Graham. So yeah, I see. Uh, so I think that's a disruptive. Things like Kickstarter have in a way disrupted uh, Y Combinator. Basically the barrier mm. for raising, like if you called Y Combinator sort of the pre-seed stage back in 2006 and exiting, you would get a seed round. Then it kind of got inflated where you would exit Y Combinator and get an A round, which made Y Combinator kind of the seed round. Now you could say that there's like a couple of layers before Y Combinator, right? There's like three or four layers. So YC has almost sort of inflated itself into the middle of the pipeline and it's become inbred. Um, and also I think when Paul Graham stepped aside and Sam Altman took over and now I think Sam Altman has also stepped aside and somebody I else. I thought he stepped aside at some point. I don't remember. But... So now it's like it's a third generation machine and it's not clear what it does but apparently it does a few things well enough that it's going on. But it, But it's no longer sort of the interesting intellectual core of Silicon Valley. Like at one point you would say that the interesting conversations in Silicon Valley revolve around Y Combinator community. I don't think that's true anymore. Yeah, I think that's interesting. That's really, I think that's a good point about it to make at least. Um, it's kind of, you know, we're talking about Y Combinator sort of being this recursive iterative thing. It's interesting that it's like <laughs> recursed itself into like a not as interesting position maybe in the, the ecosystem. Um, but, but that's, that's like, I think it does. You should praise them for that, right? About... I mean, that's a kind of success that uh, should be, I don't know, recognized and praised a little bit because yeah. you know, becoming the victim of your own success is kind of better than becoming the victim of your own failure, right? Of a failure, yeah. Well, fail fast and like start over or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Did, did you ever consider doing a startup yourself and applying or something? Actually, I think why didn't you ever, that, uh, you must have thought of a startup. You seem like the startup-y type. I am, um, I don't know that I've ever tried starting my own startup. I have plenty of ideas. It was never for lack of an idea. It was, I think, lack of being able to ship a product, basically. But then you learn later that people go to like things like Y Combinator in order to ship the product. I don't know. The other thing, I think at some point I did look at applying to YC, Y Combinator, but the problem is that they only took teams and so I'd have to like find people to work with. And that was not a thing I ever invest a lot of time into. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, uh. I like that was enough for me to just be like, yeah, no, I don't think that's for me. But I mean, honestly, I was thinking about my employment, my own employment history. I have a tendency of always having a job, um, sometimes more than one job at the same time, um, which tends to like eat into 
your ability to do your own thing. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. Situation. I don't know. Any other thoughts on Y Combinator? I feel like I had one more and I can't remember it. It's fine. Um, yeah, well, it's a chapter in history. I, I almost think of it as like a closed historical chapter at this point. It's kind of sad to say, but I don't think they're super relevant anymore. They're there. They're like there and functioning and part of the ecosystem, but they're not like history right. making. I think you're right about them being important in a historical sense. Like you can, you use them when you're tracing things back. So I'm like tracing back my own history of like software development. Like I end up there. If you go far enough back, you end up at YC. And I'm sure that there's like a lot, you know, like someone, anyone who's worked at Dropbox, you go far enough back and like you, you end up at YC. Um, same for like Airbnb and whatever. But I do think that this like quarantine to some extent is going to like more than anything is kind of like the closing of that chapter, I think. Like if you oh, could, yeah. if you took YC as like the beginning of like this latest era of like innovation and whatever as like the seat, the starting seed point and like followed a bunch of threads forward. I think like, I feel like this is kind of like the closing of that chapter and something will come next, but I'm not sure what or where or from where. What you just said reminded me of a tweet I saw from Paul Graham, I think just a couple of weeks ago, he tweeted something like, what if all the big companies go fully remote during quarantine and then some small startup disrupts them by like uh, becoming all co-located in one place. And that's sort of, it's an interesting hypothesis. One could happen, but it kind of reveals this sort of, um, I don't know, sympathies and biases towards the kind of regime that made YC successful. Like YC's a uh, consequence of the success of the intense kind of like boiler room atmosphere of San Francisco where a lot of talent is jammed into like, you know, a couple of coffee shops and the YC office and like, you know, the physical meat space intensity is kind of what YC kind of uh, rode. Like they didn't create this culture. They kind of almost monetized it. They're like, San Francisco is this intense hub and we'll turn that into startups. And now the things are distributing it's partly a hypothesis that I think is worth tracking. Maybe Paul Graham is right. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the guy, but he's a smart guy and he gets a lot of things right. But on the other hand, it also seems to me to be a little bit of wishful thinking, like, you know, wanting the good old days of Silicon Valley when people met in coffee shops and pitched each other startup ideas over coffee where the next table could overhear you. They kind of want that culture back and I for one I'm kind of glad it's works. going away and become more distributed and more accessible to people in other you know, parts of the country and the world so I kind of like that Silicon Valley as like a physically high proximity culture is kind of dissolving into the I don't know into the internet actually and that, this is actually an example of Silicon Valley itself becoming a victim of its own success mm -hmm. like it's created this huge virtual infrastructure that's made its own geography increasingly irrelevant like I, I, like for the last six, seven years, I've actually avoided going to San Francisco. Like even if I go to the Bay Area for work, it's um, usually been flying to San Jose, do some work in South Bay and leave. Like even though it's kind of dull there, San Francisco has become increasingly insufferable. And now it's like reaching its end phase of like people fleeing in droves. It's like becoming a ghost town seems like. Yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, been back in a while. So I, I was there in January. And then, yeah. <laughs> when yeah. was I there? Yeah, I was there in February. Yeah, but, but that was, I specifically made it a point to go in February and I spent like a day and a half just taking meetings in a coffee shop in the mission uh, because I hadn't, before that, I hadn't yeah. been to the city proper for like several years. Like I went once for a panel in a conference very quickly in and out, but basically I'd spent no time in the city for a period of like four or five years. It was only like, you know, Peninsula and South Bay. Like I just stopped liking the city. It's not a pleasant place anymore. Yeah, eh, yeah. All right, so, yeah, but, but actually this is um, irrelevant to Y Combinator. They're in Mountain View, right? Not in San Francisco. I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah sure. I think Y Combinator is in uh, Mountain View. Still trying At one to point, it. Paul Graham was um, telling people uh, you should live in Mountain View where you don't have a life and you can code all the time. And then when you actually succeed, you can go be a hipster in San Francisco. That was I another of his tweets. 
I think this is why I moved to Houston. I was like, I don't feel like I've been successful enough to justify living in like big cities anymore. <laughs> I mean, I started in the big cities, you know, I explored those for like a while, but at some point it's like, now it's time to get down to work. I'm going to go make myself comfortable and get some work done. So I'm Houston. <laughs> well, um, at least the first part I think is uh, easier. Huh. Well, I've always, yeah. I've never lived in one of the truly sort of, uh, major cities until now like seattle is a second tier hub kind of i would say seattle is like houston in many ways mm -hmm. and la even though it's like a second largest yeah, metro area it's so sprawled out it's a bunch of smaller cities rather than one big city like san francisco so anyway i think i'm in the same boat but okay i think we've milked white combinator to death so great so let's move on to another point. institution that we have on our list uh which would be the yak collective yes the other so yc the other YC and soon the first YC. Yeah, that, that was kind of fun. So the, uh, I should explain the name. So I write this newsletter called The Art of Gig, which is for freelancers and you know, free agents and independent consultants. And I didn't want to do, so this was sometime in last April, so 2019 April. And I didn't want to do kind of a boring tips and trips for, tricks for consultants, kind of like, you know, boring newsletter. So at some mm -hmm. point I write, started writing like fiction in that newsletter. So. Uh, a bunch of the newsletters were set in a fictional universe with fictional consultants and like elements of magic and fantasy. And there was this uh, secret organization called um, the, you know, sorry, called the Order of the Yak. And I had like a whole elaborate world building storyline with like a, an ancient Tibetan origins and therefore it's called the Yak, <laughs> Order of the Yak. So uh, I wrote like half a dozen stories with this premise and it's still kind of going on that uh, train, but yeah, I created this whole world. Um, but at some point it was like, oh, this newsletter is growing enough and enough people are sort of like uh, reading it that maybe I should do some community stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. it started like the community and a discord. And I was like, what name should we think for it? And uh, I proposed calling it the Yak Collective and people agreed. So it's kind of weird. It's like fictional world building, fake sort of uh, mystery secret organization became kind of like a literal real world thing. But yeah, so it's basically a Discord, a Roam, a couple of uh, other sort of uh, software pieces of infrastructure, and about 300 people who kind of like are in various stages of like identifying as independents. So some of them are like full-time independents like me. Some are like what I think of as gig curious. They're like doing gigs on the side or like planning to quit their job and become independent. And what we do is basically put projects together on just topics that members dream up. So we've done one on rebooting from COVID. We've done one on, which we call the new old home on how homes are being reimagined post COVID. We're working on two now. One is called Astonishing Stories. So like um, speculative fiction about the post reboot era. And another is called Final Frontiers about uh, reimagining exploration like space and oceans and stuff. And we did one, uh, paid project for a client. So the, all of these are like, the end product is like a presentation or a report of some sort, and it's pulled together by like 15 to 25 people working in some sort of like, you know, distributed collaboration. So that's my YC pitch. And then anytime somebody points out that, hey, oh, you should have picked another name, YC is um, Y Combinator. I'm like, um, no, we want to actually displace them and take over that acronym. and. Mm -hmm. A, a mark of success might be that in the future, when people say YC, the default thing they think of is uh, the Yak Collective, not Y Combinator. That's a good thing to shoot for. That's a pretty ambitious. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> like, okay, so I mean, it is. It's interesting that you're you're creating your own yakstaposition here against like your other, you oh, know. Yeah, so, yeah. If you, so if we could for a moment, perhaps we should juxtapose the two YCs. Um, I think it's interesting that you're, um, <laughs> I think it's interesting that your, um, so like origin story, right? Or like, where did your name come from? So Y Combinator comes from like math or so it's kind of an homage to like, I would assume Alonso Church and Lambda Calculus. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's hearkening, which is kind of interesting because like Y Combinator in and of itself is like productization, which is pretty far from like pure math, which is where Y Combinator is. So in some sense, it is a little bit of storytelling about the kind of engineering that you're doing at YC because I'm pretty sure you're probably not dealing with like Lambda Calculus all that often when you're working at YC yeah. at all. Um, but you know, you can like, you're laboring under the auspice of that, like yeah. um, that 
ideology or like it's the myth, flag myth it's the flag anymore. you're rallying around yeah yeah exactly um whereas so like the flag that you and your yak collective have chosen is a mythical story of which venkat um the vgr has like created about this like mythical like consultant whatever it sounds like they get that right okay. yeah but, but I, I shouldn't claim it as entirely my own because when i think about why i chose yaks as the particular motif so uh, going back the, to the juxtaposition between the two YCs, uh, mm. Paul Graham at one point sort of uh, wrote or tweeted something ab about free agents and you know lifestyle mm. businesses in general. So lifestyle okay. businesses like Tim Ferriss going off to like Bali and creating his like online store of vitamins or whatever. But in general, yeah. or 37 Signals and all the other uh, thought leaders of the philosophy that you shouldn't kill yourself trying to build like a unicorn billion dollar startup that you know becomes a big company you should yeah. build a small lifestyle business and sort of explore sort of what you want to do but it's okay to be small it's okay to have work life balance it's okay to like you know have weekends to yourself and that philosophy is it's not quite the same as like independent consulting stuff because that's lifestyle businesses these people build actual startups that are just different from yc startups but i think a lot of indies and contractors and free agents kind of have that same philosophy like they don't want to kill themselves in a career they don't want to like you know become vice president or get the corner office or become ceo of a big company they just want to like do work they enjoy but also have you know time to have a full well-rounded life so in that sense i think everything in the indie consulting and independent contractor and gig economy world is in juxtaposition to that kind of highly ambitious driven version of Y Combinator careers in big companies and sort of becoming successful in a traditional sense. So we are off to the side of that. And because of that association, I think my mind was naturally running to, oh, lifestyle designers tend to go off to Southeast Asia. And I, this is me sort of reconstructing unconscious thought processes, but why yaks? So if you remember for a while, a yak butter tea turned into bulletproof coffee, which was kind of a thing with the lifestyle design bros. Are you familiar with this stuff? No. No, okay. So yak butter tea is a traditional uh, Tibetan drink. So it's basically yak butter with strong tea. And it's um, apparently a disgusting drink. I haven't had it, but- uh, Oh, wait, I think, I think I've them. had this before at a Mongolian place. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a traditional Tibetan tea made with yak butter. And the lifestyle designers, I forget who it was, but one of them basically invented kind of like a appropriated westernized uh, version of it, which is what bulletproof coffee is. It's a stick of butter with very strong coffee and some, you know, MCT like coconut oil or something. So it's basically yak butter tea transposed into the coffee register and oh. modernized. So yeah. there's a strong association between yaks and lifestyle design businesses in Southeast Asia and between I, lifestyle design businesses and independent consultants. So quite possibly that's where my head went and that's how I ended up with yaks as the motif. But um, yeah, so the, the juxtaposition is, uh, goes deeper. So that's a superficial sort of uh, juxtaposition, but there is a deeper juxtaposition as in the yak collective as opposed to Y Combinator, I think stands for kind of a more well-rounded lifestyle. Don't uh, um, it's okay to not be super ambitious and not want to be, you know, Elon Musk and a bil building a billion dollar company or whatever. It's okay to like just have a one person lifestyle where you enjoy yourself and the work you do. And even though I do a lot of work for ambitious uh, people at like, you know, ambitious companies, I myself am not that way. I'm kind of off on the sidelines in like second tier cities, kind of like not working very hard, to be honest. <laughs> That's why like, I have a lot of time for all these side projects. And I think the Yacht Collective, everybody who's kind of like gravitated towards it and participates and contributes to the projects has kind of a similar attitude towards ambition and being driven. So in that sense, yeah, the juxtaposition is uh, accurate. So the two YCs are foils for each other. There we go. This is a yeah. good example of a foil relationship. So YC2 is a good foil for YC1. And I'll say YC1 is us. YC2 is them. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's my big long spiel. And you've joined. You've kind of hung out in the Discord for a bit, so you've seen kind of what we do. <laughs> you haven't yeah, really been active. I haven't really participated in many conversations. It's true. Yeah. Um, we'll get you in. <laughs> yeah, you got to rope me in a little more. Pinging me for things helps some. Yeah, um, I'll, uh, we, we, when we sort of switch gears and talk more about like 
you know, hardware and experiments and hacking and making and stuff like that, uh, which we're talking about. Uh, maybe we should do a project along those lines. But anyway, so speculations. But yeah, for yeah. anybody listening, this is my sort of advertisement. If you want like a group project, come hire the Yak Collective for a consulting project. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Right. Well, I think that's most of what we have time for today. Um, do you have any final penultimate thoughts for our penultimate episode, uh, Venkat? No, other than to say tune in for the next episode. So Z should be fun and we should try and do something, I don't know, interesting and special to mark the season finale and end it on a cliffhanger or something. So, okay, yeah. yeah we, we're gonna our have to... own detective story sort of for the final yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we should set it up as a mystery and then people will want to watch season two, right? <laughs> yeah, sounds like a plan. Cool. All right. All right. Well, it's always a pleasure, Venkat, um, and I will see you next week. Always a pleasure, Lisa. See you for Z. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>